Well, I think because it, it does not need to be rare earth as well. It could just be also because you know the problem of rare earth is the same for like platinum, palladium. It's not the they're not hugely different mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, let me just quickly switch it up. So for those of you who are just arriving, we'll be starting up in a few minutes, um, but welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, if you need French translation, you can see the interpretation down in the bottom uh, and you can choose the language. Um, if you have any questions, you can just ask. Uh, and we'll, we'll probably start in about five minutes, just a couple minutes after noon, after 12 here in, yeah. on the East Coast. Uh, if you have any questions to begin with, uh, even before <laughs> our presenter starts presenting, we <laughs> have a, a Q&A section over there and you can put yeah. questions in there. It'd be good to, to write them down now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And we've had some interesting news in the recent few last days, including the information about the discovery of rare earth element trove in Turkey. Um, and, uh, and movement and investments in other rare earth mines elsewhere around the world. So this is a very timely topic. <laughs> they keep discovering them, don't they? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I think I for those of you who are just joining us, uh, we'll start in a couple of minutes. Um, just remind you that we do have French interpretation that you can access at the bottom of your screen where there is interpretation. And uh, and if you have questions immediately, you can put them in the Q&A and we'll cover them as we continue. And uh, getting up close to noon and we'll start just a few, couple of minutes after noon, like uh, 12.02 or so. Microphone. My just in case. Hello, can you hear me, John? I can. Okay, is it any better? I never know whether having a microphone is better. No, I think, I, I mean, you sounded good in both cases, <laughs> but a microphone I'm sure is helpful. Okay. And uh, I'm going to put in our chat uh, a link to our work with the Global Just Transition for those of you who want to have access to the other work that we've been doing. We'll wait just uh, just one more minute and then start things up. Um, and this also is part of a, a new network that we are establishing on rare earth elements. Uh, and I will provide a little bit more information about that in a little bit, give you an opportunity to connect with that new network. We'll just wait for one more minute and then we'll start.
Okay, excellent. So my name is John Pfeffer. I work with uh, the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC. And I also direct the Global Just Transition Project, which looks at uh, Green New Deals and similar projects all around the world. Um, and we have been focusing for the last uh, few weeks on this issue of rare earth elements. Uh, we have put together a network um, together with our partners in Barcelona, ODG, and our partners in Madagascar, Crad Oi. And uh, we are delighted to be able to welcome Jojo Nem Singh to present to us today on this critical issue of the supply chain, the global supply chain uh, that governs uh, and often does not govern <laughs> rare earth elements, uh, their extraction, their processing, their distribution around the world. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jojo briefly, and then I'm gonna pass it over to him. Uh, he's gonna give a, a 10 to 15 minute presentation with some useful slides. Uh, then I'm gonna ask him some tough questions, <laughs> and then I'm gonna open it up to you all uh, to ask your questions. And I'll uh, indicate right now that we have a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen which you can uh, include uh, or post your questions. Uh, we also have interpretation en français, uh, s'il vous plaît, uh, in the bottom of the screen. If you just click, you can have a choice between English and French. Um, so I'd like to begin by just giving a few words about Jojo Nem Singh. Um, we're delighted that he's, he's able to join us today. He's an assistant professor in international development at the International Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, which is part of the Erasmus, Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, he is the recipient of a variety of, of, uh, of grants uh, and has held two prestigious research fellowships uh, in uh, the Freie Universität in Berlin, as well as uh, at the University of Tokyo. Um, he has also worked as a consultant with a number of development agencies and international NGOs. And at the moment, he's involved in what is a very exciting project. I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about that, which is a kind of global research project on um, uh, rare earth elements and which will provide a, a kind of unique perspective on uh, and a unique window onto uh, the, the mining, the extraction of rare earth elements, the processing of rare earth elements, and uh, the, of course, the distribution and trade of rare earth elements around the world. Um, Jojo, if you, could, if you could start us off and then uh, we will we'll go immediately into the, the questions and, and then your answers. Thanks, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the network and also to, to engage with um, this exciting and interesting group of people. Um, I think I would start, let me just see if the slides are going through. Can you see it? Is it showing or no? It's okay. Yes, it's, it's okay. Okay, fantastic. Yes, so um, I wasn't quite sure how the format would be and how much I should tell about the, you know, uh, what I should be giving you. So I thought I will start by just giving you a brief overview of what we've been doing in the past 18 months uh, in this five-year multi-country study on rare earth mining and um, industrial policy. And then I'm going, I'm going to go through a couple of slides focusing on some of the key myths that we have about rare earth elements from a supply chain perspective. And then end with a discussion about the things that we should think about. What well, you know, the things that might be interesting from the point of view of, well, from an academic point of view, obviously, but also from your point of view in terms of how we might influence the political and public debate on rare earth mining and uh, just transition. So, so our project, it's a five-year research project funded by the European Research Council, ERC. Um, and what we're really interested is to examine how mining can be used as a 
strategy for economic develop development for mineral producers. Um, so the first, really, the, what we're interested in is what explains the success of some countries in generating mining-based development whilst others fail. So it's kind of like a, a direct reassessment of the resource curse, of resource dependency theories, etc. So we really want to take on this challenge of thinking about how do countries move from primary mineral production, from primary commodities-based economies to uh, towards a structural transformation of their national economy into a more, more complex, more diversified export sector that could lead to long-term and more sustainable economic development. That's really the crux of the work that we try to do. But as I was putting together this proposal, I think it was back in 2019, 2018, um, it became very clear that the role of consuming countries and firms would be central if we are to talk about supply chain and if we're to talk about industrialization in the global south. So what we really did in the project is to think about the extent to which whatever attempts at industrialization in mining producing countries are influenced and are shaped by the countries that are using these minerals as primary materials in sustaining their industrial competitiveness. And so the question we really lay out here is sort of the, 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 the need to think about production and consumption at the same time, if we want to understand um, the changing dynamics of rare earth mining and generally, you know, how economic development happens in the rest of the developing world. So, you know, we've been in this project for 18 months, so there's been a lot of changes in the project. One, one of the main things that we've done is, of course, we're still looking at rare earth elements, but we've now started to think about the significance of also looking at base metals and other critical raw materials, because mining for the energy transition does not only require rare earth elements, it will require the unfettered and the continuous expansion of mining across different types of mineral deposits. And all these mining that's going to take place or that's taking place in most, well, principally, as I'm going to show you, in China and in the developing world are inputs to the high tech, uh, to, to the industrial application segments, to the downstream segment of the supply chain. So we're really looking at the advanced manufacturing industries. We're looking at military and defense technologies. We're looking at clean energy, renewable energy. So we really wanted to see how minerals travel from the point of extraction and exploitation all the way to the end of the supply chain. So as we proceed with this, we began to look at what we call the intermediate sectors, where surprisingly, you know, countries that you never think would be playing a big role are, are starting to shape the supply chain. And I would argue, in fact, that to understand how value is added across the supply chain, you, start, you need to start looking at intermediate sectors and intermediate technologies, because for most of the developing countries, they will need to add value and to expand their sectoral linkages from mineral extraction and processing, maybe all the way to intermediate, to these intermediate sectors, as opposed to going all the way to the last segment, the downstream segment of the supply chain. So in our project, what we really want to do is to look at the sort of the what I would call the institutional complementarities of different policies and strategies. We can't look at mining simply from the point of view of how to extract and exploit the natural resource, how to how to how to uh, distribute fiscal resources and mineral rents that come from the extractive industry. We also need to think about the significance of um, industrial policy, in particular, uh, what I call the uh, you know sectoral linkages. Basically, the idea is that mining can build um, related industries around it, and that's how value-added activities are generated in the sector. So in a sense, it goes back to the classic Hirschman's argument on, on the linkages theory. And finally, given particularly that we're now looking at the clean energy transition as an almost inevitable process globally, I think it's also important to think about the fit between resource policy and industrial policy to environmental regulation. So I think there's now a, a lot of move towards 
thinking through how mining can be more sustainable, how mining can be can can reduce its um, carbon footprint, can reduce its energy intensity. So environmental policies will play a significant role. So these three key policy strategies uh, are our main focus in the project across both the consuming countries and the mining producing countries. So just to give you an idea, this is how our project looks like. Our three main cases are Brazil, China, and Kazakhstan. But we've now looked at base metal resources as well as countries that are essentially dependent on oil because their energy transition pathway and their industrial strategy will differ quite significantly from other countries. And this is also where we start to link the significance of um, advanced industrialized countries, the consuming countries, in, in, in order for them, uh, as they try to, to exert their influence in the mining supply chain. Okay, um, let me start with something very basic, which um, I'm pretty sure because this is a network of on rare earth elements is, is something that's very elementary for you. But what are the rare earth elements that we're talking about? So we're really looking at 17 elements with similar chemical properties. Um, they're often called the vitamins of the modern economy. They're mined in small quantities, but they require very complex, um, uh, um, very complex activities of separation and processing. And in that process, you kind of then create a very uh, long supply chain. So, um, you know, from the point of extraction and production, you start processing them, you produce alloys, and then you produce components and then assemble them into, uh, into um, intermediate outputs before they end up in advanced manufacturing, in renewable energy, et cetera. So we often look at these um, rare earth elements as inputs in the modern economy, as opposed to, uh, uh, as opposed to final outputs in, in, the, in the supply chain. So the first, I, I want to look at a couple of three main myths about rare earth supply chain. The first myth is we are often told that China controls the resources, therefore we have no out of the dependence from China in the long term. And of course, if you look at current data, that is exactly what it looks like. You know, if we, we basically look at production and reserve, it's very obvious that China is producing all of this. So there's two ways to think about it. The first is, we need to understand how China became the major supplier of rare earth. It isn't simply because China wanted to extract as much minerals as possible. So there's, from a supply chain perspective, one of the most important things that took place is that countries like the United States um, have, uh, you know, uh, had uh, decided to close down their important REE mining project in Mountain Pass in California. Um, and there's, there has not been any significant investment in processing technology, which is what explained why China after 20, 30 years became the dominant market player. The other point here is there was kind of an unspoken agreement between China and the rest of the world that China will be extracting all these minerals and they, they will be supplying primary materials and that the, that the world market will, and you know, selling that to the world market and then the world market as you know, the globalized world market would be the source of primary materials for the EU, for Japan, for Korea, and for the United States. So that's really the story of why we are where we are at the moment. So there's a lot of pull and push factors. So it isn't simply that China exerted their influence in order to control the market. There's a lot of um, factors that are beyond China and also that there's a lot of agency exercised by other countries that led to this monopoly position. But I think what's interesting is to go back to the question, do we have resource scarcity? And most of the data that we have at the moment is actually saying we don't. <laughs> so for example, if we compare reserves and resources, the basic definition of reserve and resources is that um, uh, reserves are those minerals that we can extract in exploitable deposits, meaning under certain market conditions, we can take them out. And then resources are the known amount of minerals in an existing deposit. So in what this really shows you here in this graph is um, 
China has a lot of resources. That's definitely the case. But we also have available um, mineral reserves in other places. Now, what explains China's dominance is that under current market conditions, under current technologies, China become, became the dominant market player. And that's not to say that this is going to stay in the long term. So there's a lot of good reasons to argue that mining reserves, you know, mining, mining re reserves can be changed over a long period. Um, we can develop certain technologies in order to recycle, for example, uh, mine tailings and mine waste in order to extract rare earth and turn them into oxides. So there are certain technological changes, certain policies that can be implemented in order for us to gradually reduce our dependence on China. So where I'm going at is I'm not going to come here and say, you know, well we, well, we won't be dependent on China in 10, 15 years, because it took China 30, 40 years, roughly. They started in the early 1970s up to this point in order to maintain and, you know, to achieve that dominant monopoly position. So it'll take us quite some time to reach a point of autonomy from China. But I think it's not helpful from a public policy point of view. It's not helpful from a transition perspective, you know, energy transition perspective to see this as necessarily a problem. One important point to also think about is that there are several problems in China when it comes to mining rare earth. So for example, there's a huge issue on illegal mining in China. So in fact, there has been several policy papers in, uh, that have been announced by China on the need to, you know, it'll be better to curb illegal mining, that it'll be good for China to share some, you know, some of these market uh, um, participants, you know, to expand market participation of other countries towards China, uh, you know, towards the REE market. So there are many good reasons to imagine that China does not need, you know, 90% control of the market at this stage, because what the Chinese policy really intends to do is to maintain sufficient resources so that it can pursue its national development strategy, its industrialization plans, its goal to link the production of mining to the production of advanced manufacturing, high-tech products, et cetera. And it has enough of that. And it is, it doesn't need 90% control in order to achieve that, you know, to, to in order to achieve such in uh, such objective, such policy objective. So I think it's really important to think about that the supply question is, is a construct that we have, and it's a policy construct, it's a uh, it, it's a narrative that we have, um, and, and that there is a way out, out of this narrative. It's not going to be very easy because, as I, again, as I said, it took China four decades to achieve where it is, but it's not an, uh, uh, an inevitable position. Second is um, there's, there's a whole myth-making that our dependence on rare earth is problematic because, of the, because it's China. Um, and so if we invest in recycling or substitution, we can find and secure the minerals for the green transition. Um, yes, China has control over several minerals, but you know, the rest of the world also has important minerals out there that we need for the energy transition. So it really is problematic when we start to just zoom in and focus on China as the issue, because for example, you know, with the current Ukraine Russia conflict, I think the Europeans are as worried uh, about their dependence on China as as uh, as well as their dependence on Russia and Ukraine and other raw materials that they can get from the um, the east side of the continent. So what I'm getting at here is that the energy transition will require a lot of minerals. It will require multiple strategies, not just recycling, not just substitution, but also we may need to start thinking about opening new mining projects within Europe. We may need to think about new mining projects in the United States in Latin America. So zooming into China as if China is exercising such control and China will be the impediment for the green transition is not a helpful point of departure for us when we think about how to pursue green energy transition, you know, how to produce, how to promote clean energy technologies. And 
I think one of the most interesting data that I always find is how much minerals do you need to produce certain kinds of renewable energy technology? So this is just a graph that I always use just to emphasize that the clean energy transition isn't just about producing as many electric cars as possible, but it's really about securing as many minerals as possible in order for us to reach that net zero target, in order for us to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius global target of uh, uh, you know, preventing um, uh, the warming of the planet. And as we embark on this journey to produce bigger wind turbines, more electric cars, we are demanding more minerals and the current supply chain is not going to be able to meet them. So there's a lot of pressure on developing countries, on countries like the DRC, which produces cobalt, on countries like the Philippines and Indonesia, which are the main sources of nickel, to countries like Chile, which has lithium and copper. So the more we push for the clean energy transition, the more we require the extraction of minerals from these countries. And so there is a lot of issues that come with that. that you know, it's a developmental opportunity for mineral producers, for some of them, they may interpret it that way, but it's also enormous pressure for countries because if we're demanding 100% renewable energy in the public transport system in Europe, you know, in five years, we're actually expecting that all these minerals will be extracted in uh, uh, in in the next five years, which of course the uh, which 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 again goes which, which then leads me to the next point about the lack of understanding of people on how the mining industry operates. So the moment I mean, just to give a very quick you know overview of the mining industry, when you find when you prospect a mineral deposit and you found oh there's possible commercially viable deposit of niobium in Arasha in, in Brazil. Um, from the point that you discovered that prospectable deposit to the point of extraction and then production and then actually you know, getting it out into commercially viable ore and uh, um, oxide, um, that's at least about five to 10 years. So the life cycle of a mining project starts you know, within the first 10 years, and, and that's the high risk period in a mining project. That's the point when companies may lose funding um, because there's not enough money from the financial markets. It may be, a, you know, it, could be uh, uh, it could be that the policy changes or the government in power has decided not to mine. So there's a lot of things that can go on. And so if we have this enormous pressure because of the green energy transition, because of clean energy technologies, we're actually not taking into account how difficult this is gonna be for the mineral producing countries, for the firms who are actually going to also put the money to risk and extract all these minerals. So I think it's really important for us to think about the dynamics of the mining industry and the kind of expectations that we have in order to achieve the, the clean energy transition. Finally, um, I think the third, uh, uh, um, the third myth that has been uh, going on when it comes to critical minerals is that because everything now is concentrated in China, there's no opportunity for other countries to develop their industry for long-term growth. Um, yes, that's true for rare earth, I think, because China gradually increased control over the processing they've developed uh, the technology, the processing and separation technology for um, heavy rare earth elements, but that's not necessarily true for all the other uh, materials that we need for clean energy technology. The other thing I guess that we need to think about is, for example, the case of niobium in Brazil is, is interesting. Brazil had niobium and they could also extract rare earth elements, but the Brazilian company CBMM decided to focus their investment in developing niobium and industrial applications of niobium, mostly in, in, in uh, military and defense applications. Why? Because they didn't see the point of competing against China on rare earth. My point here is that countries and companies, you know, those are, who are in the mining industry have an opportunity to think about the complex supply chain that exists to identify possible risks, but also to identify possible 
um, opportunities for long-term economic growth. And so, as you know, today, Brazil produces 87% of niobium and it's being used directly for several derivatives in the manufacturing, uh, sorry, in the military and defense industry. So it's really about finding what I, you know, finding new comparative advantages, finding new ways and niche, creating niche markets in order for the mining product to end up in, um, to, to, in to, you know, to, to maximize the effect and the value addition in the sector. Now, I want to close by talking, by, by um, raising a couple of points in terms of what we might want to think about. The first thing is, I really find it problematic that we think of clean energy as if it's such a simple supply chain. Um, the supply chain for each technology is very distinctive, as again, as I mentioned, niobium versus rare earth. And each of these supply chain comes with specific challenges and opportunities. And I think that this is a, an important lesson for developing countries. It's really about, you know, discovering a country's comparative advantages, finding its way in the global market in order for the country to move forward and um, produce long-term economic development. So it's really important that we take into account the specificity, not just the, not just the geographical characteristics or the chemical property of the mineral that you're studying, but also the specific market that exists for each of these minerals. And of course, promoting the appropriate policies in order to achieve those objectives, public policy objectives. The second point is that we may think that rare earth mining and other critical minerals are seem to be very different, but are actually similar when it comes to the major issues on mining. And we have a very good knowledge base of what these problems are. We know that environmental legislations are important. We know social licensing is important when we start new mining projects. We know tax policy, fiscal policy is central for mineral states in order for them to maximize the gains from the mining industry. So we have a huge stock of knowledge on what went wrong with several mining countries, and we can try to think about the best practices on how to avoid them, on how to minimize the, the, you know, the effects of, of the mining industry as we extract these minerals. And, and in co uh, corollary to that point, I want to make clear that um, you know, there's a whole discourse on responsible mining and sustainable mining. Um, to me, that discourse should not be equated to cost-free mining. I think it's really important to, 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 to accept the fact that there's gonna be what I call the politics of sacrifice. If you don't mine it in Spain or in Sweden, somewhere, somewhere in Africa or in Latin America, it needs to be mined because there is a demand for it. So someone will be suffering the consequences of weaker environmental legislations, weaker social regulatory frameworks. And so we need to be wary when people are talking about sustainable mining, because I think that um, it's simply passing on the burden to other countries and other um, you know, communities as well, in particular, who often, don't have the ability to, to go against mining industry and to go against um, uh, the government who are pushing for it. And vice versa, I think the issue is whenever mining projects are rejected in Europe and in the US, we should also be aware that this could be tantamount to nimbyism, not in my backyard approach, that as you decide not to have mining under strict regulations, in the US and in the European Union, you're actually you know, expecting still that the mineral will be extracted coming from somewhere and you'll buy it from the market. So there's always an effect whenever these political decisions are made from one place to the other. Finally, I think if there is something that's really important about the rare earth supply chain, I think it's that Hegemonic power struggles, the current reconfiguration of power between China, US, and whatever multipolar order, order we're going to come up with, um, this is going to implicate not just the clean energy transition, but also how we will deal with the problems that come with uh, um, the, you know, the, the, the mutually reinforcing effect of the power struggle on the one hand 
and how we're going to secure these minerals for clean energy. And I think that we can't separate geopolitics from the economic rationale now. So it's we're now past the point in global history where you know we can think about economic globalization or the logic of the market as the as the um, the wheel, you know, as the as the thing that drives countries' policies and firms' decisions. We're actually now at a point in history where security, geopolitics, um, political interests are very intertwined with economic interests and, and economic calculations. And on that note, I will open the floor for everyone to ask questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jojo. That was, that was really superb. Um, uh, again, my name is John Pfeffer. I'm with the Institute for Policy Studies, and you've just been listening to Jojo Nem Singh uh, talking about the global supply chain around rare earth elements and some other critical strategic materials as well. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we do have one question in the chat, which I'll fold in with the, the other two that we've, we've uh, gotten already. Um, before going to those questions, I want to... Um, say something about uh, something you referred to in your comments, Jojo, and that was that we have a network of folks, of scholars and activists uh, who are focusing on rare earth elements. Uh, it's called Regroup, as in R-E-E -E group. And if you're interested in, in joining us, please just send me your, uh, your email address and I'll, I'll add you to the list. Um, I'll make this appeal later on as well. Um, but I just wanted to flag it here at the top. Um, we have a couple of questions already. Uh, I want to uh, start though with, with a couple of my own, <laughs> since I'm <laughs> prerogative of the, the facilitator. Um, and one's a general question and it, it's about supply chains and their evolution uh, post pandemic or during pandemic, frankly, because of course we've seen uh, supply chains suffer you know, a huge blow as a result of, of the shutdowns of, of factories, of labor shortages, um, on top of already what was called slobalization, already a, yeah. a kind of a, a slowdown in, in, the, uh, in the globalization process. In other words, the uh, overseas investments, uh, the establishment of, uh, of you know, a global assembly line, a slowdown in that process. So my question is, you know, to what extent are rare earth elements subject to this transformation of the supply chain? I mean, are we seeing, for instance, new choke points or new kinks develop in, in the supply chain? And of course, you've, you've emphasized the importance not only of the raw materials, but of the intermediary uh, producers. Of course, the folks who are producing the batteries, the folks who are producing uh, the, um, uh, the computer chips. And, and we are well aware that there has been a shortage, for instance, of computer chips that are are central to the production both of electric vehicles and, and frankly standard combustion vehicles as well. Um, so can you give us a little bit of um, illumination, shall we say, about yeah. what, what, the, what the supply chain is looking like kind of as a result of the pandemic and other kind of forces uh, that have impinged on globalization over the last few years? Yeah. Uh, okay. And I think I would be able to touch on the question by Hong Kiao Liu as well as I discuss this. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is I think we now, I mean, so if I understood that question about characterization of the South and the North. So, I mean, the starting point is that I don't see countries like Brazil and China as global South anymore. If, if, if that's, uh, I think we have to be careful in terms of the North South uh, uh, question. But, you know, um, the, the supply chain is changing very fast for several reasons. Some of them you mentioned, but some of them very specific to the sector. So for example, I think it was last year. Yeah, so I think it was last year that China decided to merge. So if you look at the supply chain in China, there are mainly six big rare earth mining companies. And China has decided to merge three of them into one super SOE. So this is gonna impact on the reserves and uh, basically control over mineral production and extraction and processing. So we anticipate major changes as this uh, is taking place. The second point is that European Union and other countries did not really stand 
you know, idle as these changes are taking place already. So I think that um, it's also important to, to, to consider, for example, that uh, the US created the mineral, I think they call it the mineral quad. So they're basically going to encourage countries like Australia, Vietnam, India to increase their mineral production and, and start mining uh, uh, for their, um, to start basically new mining projects in these countries. Um, the other thing is within Europe, because of the war, between Ukraine and Russia, as well as some of important thorny issues with rela in relation to China. There's a lot of movement in connection to the new Green Deal, but also in connection to the BRI. So the European Union established the Green Deal. They had the new bat the, the EU Battery Alliance. They also launched the um, Global Gateway Infrastructure Project. So there's a lot of things taking place at the moment in response to the, the, obvi the obvious control of China in these minerals. So how does this square and what would it look like after? Um, I honestly, I think the question is whether like African countries, for example, will take up the offer of the EU when it comes to global gateway infrastructure, um, whether the Battery Alliance will be able to secure uh, its minerals in order for them to keep the industrial competitiveness of the EU, in order for them to close the loop of the supply chain. So there are a lot of things that are taking place in response to, to what's happening. The other point that I wanted to make, which just came out from our meeting in the team workshop we did this week, Japan just discovered some rare earth 1,900 kilometers away from, from Tokyo. Um, and they're planning to become independent. Uh, I don't know to what extent this um, rare earth deposit is commercially viable, but there are plans at the moment already to establish mining prospecting in this, in this part of Japan. So the supply chain will be looking very different in a year's time, I think, once investments uh, have gone through and once, once these countries have pushed towards. The issue, of course, is that a lot of these are early stages, you know, kind of embryonic moves from the part of the EU, for example. Um, so we'll have to see how effective these policies are in order for them to gradually chip away that controlled by China. I want to go back to that point, uh, that question by Hong Kiao Liu about, you know, what's realistic about China. Yes, I think one of the main things that we need to remember is the, the Chinese um, government success, if I want to put it in terms of success and failure, is that it was able to close that loop between the production of mining all the way to the downstream segment, the production of wind turbines, solar panels, clean energy technologies, new energy vehicles, etc. So I think that um, this is why there's a big narrative, there's a huge political narrative in Europe about you know, China be Chinese de dependence on China as a threat. And so the whole discourse on strategic autonomy is really based on the fact that it's not going to be five or 10 years before we can reduce the, you know, our dependence on China for not just for rare earth, but also for, you know, the production of clean energy technologies and clean energy applications. So that's going to be an interesting thing to, to, to look at how the, at least in the debate within Europe, for example, there's a big question on how the German government will reposition itself, how the manufacturing in particular, uh, the, the automobile industry and the solar panel and the wind turbine industry will be positioning themselves across the debate in order to promote the European business interests. Um, finally, I think the, the, there's an interesting point that for a very long time, a lot of the, the mining industry in Europe have, has been relegated in public policy because there's a general perception in Europe that mining is bad. You know, They think of mining, they think of coal. So that has changed fundamentally because of the crisis taking, that, that we have here in Europe. They've also changed the perspective because of the clean energy debate that now you know, we may need to think about domestic and regional supply chains within Europe. So these are, policy questions and policy debates that are ongoing 
um, you know, we'll be happy to talk about it in a year's time, what we find from the field, uh, you know, just to give you back uh, if, if there are major changes that have taken place. Excellent, thank you. There've been a couple of questions about recycling and reuse uh, yeah. and the degree to which uh, that can be scaled up to really decrease both the, the dependency on, uh, on existing reserves, but also to ensure that uh, there's less of a need for new mines and whether that has also any, has had an effect on the projections of, or you know, the, the, the needs of, uh, of rare earth elements in the production of uh, clean energy technologies in particular? Um, so at least I can speak with in the context of the EU because this is the research that I've been doing in the past um, 12 months. Recycling or the what they call the circular economy is a major, uh, it's a major strategy of the EU. Partly political because it sells best, you know, it sells really well among the European governments uh, and the public. And partly because I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunities for recycling here in Europe. We don't have as good industrial recycling compared to Japan, for example. So, you know, just closing the loop of the, the recycling industry here is, is going to have some effect. Now, is it going to be sufficient? No. As far as I've seen all the literature uh, in the past two to three years, most of the recycling would say, no, we're not going to make it because for two reasons. One is our demand is increasing. So it's not like we're trying to meet the same level of demand as we're trying to recycle. So our goalpost is moving higher and higher as countries transition towards renewable energy and clean energy technology. The second is we don't have, um, so for example, recycling wind turbines, they're only going to start recycling the big wind turbines that was uh, put in uh, 50 years ago. So we're not even at a point where we have the technology to recycle the whole wind turbine. The, and then the final point is technology is moving very fast because, um, because of the criticality of rare earth, there's also movement to develop permanent magnets, which you need for wind turbines, um, you know, uh, that don't have rare earth elements. So kind of like replacing it with another metal. Now, that's not necessarily a bad idea, but it simply means that you're kind of, um, you have multiple, you have multiple initiatives that, that are going on. And so, as you know, politics is about priority. And so if the prioritization is wrong, in the sense, uh, then it's going to be really hard to, to achieve the polls, you know, the goal that, that we set. So at least in the context of the EU, um, the, the goal is industrial recycling, you know, closing the loop of the circular economy. Um, they've invested a lot of R&D and, you know, promoting companies in order to invest in, in, in recycling as well. Um, but I think, yeah, it's not, um, we're not at a point to say that recycling can solve the problem. Excellent. Well, that, that leads to uh, a couple of other questions, which were basically about NIMBY uh, and your comments yeah. about NIMBY and uh, not in my backyard. Uh, and your comments were very interesting because as you point out, if we, uh, if uh, a, a project, for instance, in the global north is closed down, then effectively uh, that country is, is basically outsourcing its, its need for dirty materials. Uh, and that will inevitably uh, lead to either a, an expansion of mining at a site in the global south or a new mine. Um, and that in some sense, the, the regulation or the regulatory framework in the global north, environmental uh, labor tends to be a little stricter. Although as some people have pointed out, in some cases, that's not the case. I mean, either because there's uh, an overriding strategic importance and so the, the rules are bent a little bit in order to, to, uh, in, to, you know, to authorize the mining. And we're talking about pretty dirty stuff. I mean, that's another kind of key element of rare earth uh, elements. Um, they sound like they're kind of rare and small and so on the vitamins, as you said, of the, of the uh, global economy, but the, the mining process itself is actually quite dirty. Um, and so the communities in the global north that are affected by these mines inevitably are gonna say, 
of course we don't want it in our backyard. Who wants this in our backyard? So the question is, how do we balance those, those issues? Are, do we have um, more global regulations that can be applied so that um, uh, the, the regulatory framework and weaker environments are strengthened? Um, how do we make these choices about who makes the sacrifices, in other words? Because you said this is a question of, of sacrifice. How do we make those decisions in a democratic fashion? So, I mean, I think the starting point in, in a couple of papers that I've been publishing in the past 12 months, I started with the, I had a paper at the Wilson Center on mining our way out of the climate change conundrum. And then we had, we just released a white paper here in, uh, um, in Leiden, you know, it's a basically from three universities if people are interested. So it's basically a position paper of seven scientists, including myself. And in this paper, I clearly made a point about the need for a domestic regional supply chain in Europe. I think that, um, so the first point is that we don't want to mine and have no regulation. So I think this is the starting point. We need to be clear that whether it's gonna be in the European Union, in the US or in, in Latin America, we need to improve the environmental and social standards. Now, it is the case that there are stricter regulations here in, um, in the European Union. So for example, there's only currently one rare earth project in Europe, in Sweden. It's in central Sweden called Norasher. And they've been applying for a social environmental license for three times, and they've been rejected several times. Um, so I think one of the main issues, of course, is because Sweden has one of the highest social environmental standards. Now, I guess the question is, can we apply the same level of standards that Sweden is applying, which led to the denial of these um, REE project in Sweden, if we start doing that in places like Burundi, which have massive rare earth elements, or Turkey, or other places. So I think the issue really is, um, there's a lot of pressure for, uh, maybe it's not the direct answer to the question, but I think, you know, there might be, it might be a situation where maybe mining should be less in developing countries in order to increase the pressure for the developed countries to also think and consider about the need to create the, you know, a more sustainable mining industry within, within the European Union, for example. The other point is that we do have models in which social environmental regulations have worked, and maybe it's about scaling up or learning from them. So countries like Australia, which has a, um, you know, it's a successful mining country. There's always a debate about what you consider successful and failure with mining. Chile is successful. Is it? Is it not? But I think that countries that have been living off from the mining industry and sustaining, the mine, and sustaining themselves through mining industry may teach us more lessons on how to do mining better. And, and maybe that's the way forward. I don't think implementing the Swedish standard in other places will work for several reasons. Uh, but the, first, the main reason is there's more intensity, uh, there's more intense pressure for developing countries to extract the mine compared to Sweden. And I think the incentive structures are just different. You know, you may find mines in Germany, in Spain, in France, but they're not dependent in the mining industry and therefore they could always opt to say no. Whereas countries like the DRC, Chile, Bolivia, these are countries that have historically for three, four centuries been, you know, they've been mining different minerals every century. And so it may be harder for these countries to just stop mining. And, and I don't think they will. And um, uh, you know, in some instances, Chile, for example, the mining communities are pretty much in favor of mining because they have the highest salary. Um, they benefit, you know, con mining communities that are, there are, have been studies about mining communities that are closer, you know, people who are closer living in the mining area where they're high, where there are better regulations, they tend to benefit the most and they tend to be pro-mining. So there are studies like this in Sweden, in Chile as well. So... I guess it's a matter of what we can learn from the standard setting that you can find in countries that have been successful at mining. Sweden is a highly successful country in terms of, it's a country that has had mining throughout its history. So is Norway and Finland. So we may be able to learn something from them, but I don't think imposing the standards that they have is gonna work in other 
countries as well, just because the incentive structures are very different. Um, uh, that would be my, it, it's a hard question, I think. Uh, um, and it may not be a satisfactory answer for most. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it is a hard question. And, and it's complicated by the fact that, for instance, here in the United States, which is somewhat different uh, in terms of its, uh, the polarization of economic wealth in, say, Sweden, it, the mining tends to take place in, I mean, it doesn't take place in Kennebunkport, for instance. It doesn't take place in the rich communities here in the United States. It tends to take place in uh, areas uh, that are much poorer and, and therefore they have less political clout and they have less ability to affect the regulatory framework. Um, so that's, that's another kind of challenge in, in, ter in terms of the siting of, of uh, these mines. Um, Someone asked about Turkey, about the, the recent news about the rather large um, rare earth element uh, cash. And I, we were wondering if, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, Turkey is, I mean, it's not quite part of Europe. I mean, it's obviously, uh, it's a member of NATO. It's, it participates in some European institutions, but of course it's, it's been a candidate for the European Union for decades, um, but it, it's obviously not, uh, not part of uh, European decision-making structures. Um, what do you think this will, what, what kind of impact will this have on uh, both in Europe and, and globally in terms of this, this news? I, mean, I can't talk, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a bit hard, uh, but, but I think the issue for Europe is always um, the European Union, it, it's very clear from the side of the EU that the um, they would like to get their minerals from the market, so to speak, from the global market. So this is a this is the reason that what our research has, uh, you know, we we've been able to establish that that um, the, the European strategy is really not to, to avoid as much as possible the extraction in 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 the EU. Um, so I guess any discovery or prospect of of mineral production somewhere else would be a great. Uh, news for for the for the European Union, but I think here the there has been some uh, changes in terms of thinking, particularly because of the Ukraine uh, the Ukraine Russia conflict. There's um, you know Germany decided to increase their defense. Um, the domestic supply chain issue became very important, not just because of COVID, but because of the dependence on minerals from Russia. Um, wheat from Ukraine. So that has changed the policy position of, of several actors in, in Sweden, for example, at least in Sweden, where we were doing our interviews. Um, we did some interview pre and post, uh, well, during pre, pre Russia Ukraine conflict. And then now we've been doing interviews back again in Sweden. So there have been some small changes in terms of the position over um, over mineral dependence, so I think this 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 is the big change that's going to take place here. Excellent. Um, environmental regulations. I mean, uh, we do have we we know that there are considerable environmental um, uh, consequences uh, of mining, both in. Uh, both in extraction and in processing. Um, and how do we and, and balance that with the fact that, you know, the overall, overall kind of requirement of uh, uh, and the need for these elements for uh, a clean energy transition. So there's obviously a, a kind of um, a, uh, a delicate balance between uh, the environmental needs here, but focusing specifically on the environmental consequences of rare earth element mining, any insight into kind of best practices or um, how to uh, minimize uh, the impacts on, on the environment from these mines? Yeah, I just saw Julie's point actually. Yeah, um, so well, one of the interesting things that are taking place in Sweden is what they call the green steel, which is their decarbonizing steel project, the, the big steel project in the Northern part of Sweden. So I think that if, if you wanna learn, if we wanna learn something about how environmental standards can be married with, um, 
mining legislation and mining regulatory framework, I guess there are, there's some lessons to get to learn from the way the Swedes have been doing. But I'm always cautious about this because, um, you know, we're looking at Sweden is not an it, it's its political and economic context is always radically different from most places in the world. Um, but I think that countries that are able to to find the, that balance between um, environmental environmental legislation, FPIC, uh, you know, free prior and informed consent, for example, in some instances, um, countries that were able to to maneuver this might be a good um, might be a good source of inspiration. The other point, I guess, is um, the, the, I mean, I get the, the other point that, that I, I want to look at is the, um, a lot of mining projects are energy intensive and some of them are run in coal. So for example, some of these, uh, one of the main problems, of course, of decarbonization in, in China is the fact that coal powered plants are, are remain, remain to be one of the highest um, carbon emission. So in that sense, by, I mean, I guess the issue is, can we decarbonize the mining industry as we intensify the extraction of mineral because the demand for, these, for, for the industry is, is, is accelerating very fast. So, Sometimes I think that um, the, is the issue because you know the mines are heavily dependent on coal power plant and it's heavily carbon intensive, or can we do also something about pacing the consumption side, you know, the demand side? Because if we're going to keep chasing the supply problem and the demand we don't talk about then it's going to be really hard because the you know the balance the equilibrium of the demand and the supply will never be achieved one debate here in europe is making public and making citizens more aware for example if you buy a new cell phone you're getting all these minerals you know if you replace your phone you could you know if you don't replace a phone you could have save x battery so there are some of these campaigns at the moment in europe in terms of just making the public a little bit more aware i know for a fact that in sweden there's a lot more political debate on this but i wouldn't say that's true for many countries across europe the other thing is it depends on um the country because some countries are not reliant on mining whilst others are more reliant on mining and manufacturing. So Germany will have a much more complicated policy decision because it's have, it has a huge car manufacturing industry as well as clean energy technology sector. So within Germany alone, what kind of policy the government will, will, will push through is a big debate already. And of course, in the context of the EU, what happens in Germany has a lot of implications for the rest of the EU. So, so I think, this the, the at the moment at the policy level at the level of national and EU governments, the main decisions that need to be made really are about you know um, are the policies are the strategies going to just focus on the supply, um, you know is it just going to be on recycling, or can we focus more also on on increasing public participation for example on the on the, in order to reduce the demand. Um, so I don't know to what extent this could be, you know, this could be scaled up. Uh, at least in the EU, the debate is very different across countries. So some countries will be more amenable than others. The other issue, of course, is um, to what extent can clean energy technology be seen as an important emerging industry? Because, uh, you know, the success of China is that they were able to turn the renewable energy sector into a competitive sector that the Chinese can, uh, that they've seen as their new comparative advantage. And so they see the, they see the energy industry, the new energy industry, you know, renewable energy as an export sector. And that's a different mentality to the Europeans because the Europeans see the Green Deal as a political project. So I think this is an important uh, distinction as well. Maybe some countries that think that they can benefit more if they invest in clean energy and they can participate in that new export sector, they will have more incentives to think about 
environmental policies to mitigate the effects of rare earth and other critical minerals. Whereas for other countries, this is really more, oh, we're doing this because you know, it's good for the environment. So very different incentive structures as well and different political debates across them. Good, excellent. A couple of comments from the chat. One that of course mining does contribute to, to climate change and to production of greenhouse gases. So that's a, a kind of important element to put into the, the, the equations. Uh, second, that radioactivity and the, the impact of radioactivity on communities is, is important when considering the environmental impact of, uh, of these projects. But I wanna, I wanna zero in on another comment that, that came from the chat and that is, you know, when we talk about the, the global supply chain, of course, we're talking about global, we're talking about global um, uh, uh, developments, global trajectories. Uh, much of your presentation was also about national strategies. How can countries kind of fit into that global supply chain? How can they figure out what their role can be? How can they, you know, leverage, in other words, their position uh, either as a supplier or as a processor? Uh, or as an intermediate um, you know, producer of, of uh, yeah. uh, batteries, for instance, how can they leverage that position more effectively as part of a national uh, development yeah. strategy? But the person pointed out, well, this really doesn't focus on the locale. In other words, exactly where the footprint is, where the, where the mine is located. Um, in other words, uh, it's often assumed that, okay, we have this global supply chain, we have these national strategies, you all are just gonna to have to go along with this because, hey, you know, it's, it's either because of the overall global priority of reducing carbon emissions or national priority of a development strategy. And when you get down to the locality, it's like, well, you might all not be happy with, you know, the impact of mining in communities, but for these other reasons, I'm sorry, but we're gonna to have to ask you for, to make these sacrifices. So the question, in some sense, is a restatement of an earlier question is, how do we kind of bring in the, the locale? How are, is it just a matter of protest? And if the protest is significant enough, well, then, you know, the corporation will call it off because there's too much heat, you know, or the government will scale back on its, uh, on its uh, financing of the project because there's been so much protest from constituents and that will have an impact on voting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or is there some other way to kind of really kind of incorporate local perspectives in this larger picture of global trends and national development strategies? So I, I'm gonna point out two examples that I have um, encountered in the process of uh, in, in this project. The first is, again, as you know, I start with the point that the problem of rare earth and other critical minerals is not different from the problem of mining generally. So if we're going to look for, for example, um, uh, um, cases where decentralization and uh, local participation has worked, then maybe that's a model that we can kind of ramp up and, and, and and, and see if it's going to work in other places. Um, the application of free prior and informed consent, for example, is a heavily contested process. Um, there's a lot of debate how effective it is, the mechanism, the process, the output. But you know, um, the FBIC is an internationally sanctioned it's ILO 169. Is uh, most countries have signed ILO 169, so communities can use that as a means to leverage more power vis-a-vis -vis communities, uh, corporations, and, and the government. Um, the, the second point is that, which often gets forgotten in this debate, um, the unions and the workers. Um, I've been interviewing industry all, like I've done three, four interviews with them in Sweden, in Brussels, um, what's really interesting is uh, they're reframing the debate. They're talking about, you know, we're pro mining because we want, we're, we think that green jobs can emerge if the transition can be done more, more fairly and um, with the right social environmental regulatory frameworks. Maybe this is the case also because, you know, in the context of the EU, most uh, in, in many instances, um, 
the unions could influence political debates. So in, in this context, I think that um, the position of the unions and how they relate to the mining communities are pretty important. In Sweden, definitely the unions are very clearly pro-mining and uh, um, they've been saying about, uh, you know, their constituency in the mining sector, in the mining communities in the north of Sweden have been supportive of them, et cetera. So I think that it's it, there's no clear answer to that, but except that there's going to be an emerging coalition of forces in which we basically need to decide, you know, how much regulation can be put in place in order for mineral extraction to take place, in order for uh, us to be able to, to, to put in place more stringent regulations on social and environmental standards. Um, I think this is really the, at the point of the local, you know, from the point of view of how we can leverage the local, um, I think this is one possibility as well. It's thinking through, what are the different arguments that can be made and, and how can you leverage existing regulations that, you know, for it to be, uh, to, in order for us to be able to promote you know, green jobs. Um, I think it'll be different across cases. It'll be very different in Latin America for sure. Um, unions in Chile are highly corporatist and, and, and the, um, uh, the mining industry, particularly in Chile, is very strong, and they've always exerted that influence. So that debate on how lithium will be reorganized, will be renationalized, that the unions will play a big role. Of course, governments in power make a difference. In, in Latin America, we're seeing a left turn again um, across the region. Maybe that will help us rethink again you know, what is the appropriate balance between regulation and promotion of the mining industry. But I think, yeah, you, we, need, we need to look at what are the best practices that we've accumulated so far in the mining industry, look at what worked, uh, what did not work, and then learn from them, hopefully. And I guess just the final point as well, and, and uh, as from an academic point of view, we always keep saying that, um, of course, what the, the, the concept of the local is always diverse and, you know, in Peru, there are as many communities that are going and protesting and blocking mining projects. And there are people, uh, there are communities that are promoting mining as well who want different kinds of compensation. So we shouldn't also have a blanket approach on that, you know, there will be, that we would be able to identify what is the best interest in these local communities. Um, again, one point that has often been raised to me in every interview that, um, that I have, the unions would always say, you know, but we actually don't know until you talk to the people in the mines whether they're pro mining or not, because, for, you know, the people in Stockholm are against mining, but those who are in the north are pro mining in some communities. So we need to have a much more nuanced approach on what we mean by the local. And then again, I think learning from, from what we can draw from, from, from the experiences of the past. Thank you. That, that is very important. Yeah. It, it, the local is not, is not monolithic. <laughs> so it's important to, to look at the varieties of, uh, of uh, perspectives. One thing you, you mentioned early on, which I, I, I was intrigued by, but um, obviously you didn't have time to go into it. So that's why I'm asking you about it. And that is the, the role of rare earth elements in the defense sector. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, we, we know, of course, the importance of, of, uh, chips, you know, of semiconductors mm -hmm. here in the United States, there's been a lot of discussion of, uh, interestingly, the dependency of, of the United States, not on China, but on Taiwan, because mm -hmm. Taiwan is, of course, a major uh, semiconductor, uh, semiconductor uh, producer. And what would happen if whatever might happen, you know, uh, uh, geopolitically, or actually there was a there was an accident that took place uh, that knocked out the Taiwanese electricity grid about a decade ago, and that actually stopped production for six months. It had an unbelievable impact on the, on the uh, uh, global supply chains of semiconductors. So, uh, but the, the issue of the defense sector is also important because of course the defense sector is often not subject to the same kind of rules and regulations that ordinary quote unquote economic activity uh, yeah. is subject to, um, for instance, on certain trade questions, uh, on you know, uh, domestic content issues. Um, so the, the defense sector is kind of its own kind of economy. So yeah. I'm curious, 
you know, if you can give us a little bit more uh, information about the relationship between rare earth elements and the defense sector it, globally, as well as perhaps in particular countries. Yeah, um, so we're actually, because the in the past 18 months, we've been kind of drawn to the clean energy debate. Everyone kept asking us to look at the clean energy. So we've been doing a lot of work on the clean energy, but in this meeting this week with my team, we were actually starting to talk about, okay, we need to look at advanced manufacturing in military and defense. Um, I wanna just, um, there's an EU, uh, a paper that, that 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 basically they produced this a year and a half ago, and this is really about um, the strategic sectors in which rare earth and other industry and other minerals are are um, needed. You know what primary materials do we need? Um, in the particular case of defense, the most important is drone, robotics, and three D printing. Um, the the unfortunate part is that there's not a lot of research on it, as you could imagine. Um, it's because, yes, no, apart from the fact that it's not a very easy sector to look at, it's also, yeah, as you said, it's not subject to normal controls by, by, and regulations. But this particular report simply outlines, you know, what are the different kinds of metals that are being needed? Um, I suspect the issue really is, so one thing we never talk about is that, so we think, okay, we need all these minerals, and then they will go to the consumption, to the industrial applications. But in reality, because these minerals, the same minerals are required for nearly all the sectors that we're looking at. There's gonna be competition amongst the different sectors that will you know, use the mineral. And I think this is what explains the kind of accelerating demand. So of course it's, it will accelerate because of clean energy, but also because advanced manufacturing as well as defense uh, and, and, and aerospace will be needing them. So most of the things we know are mainly the ones that the Europeans have reported, at least in the context of the EU where we're doing the research. But you can see here, um, you know, they require exactly the same minerals that we will need for clean energy. Now, do they have regulation, you know, do we have regulations here that will, um, that will give them prioritization? In the context of the EU, because military spending is not a major, you know, in, in the EU, because military spending is, 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 is a very contentious policy area, I guess, um, with the Ukraine-Russia conflict not getting, you know, not, we are not foreseeing any conclusion in this particular conflict. There's going to be a lot more pressure on, um, on the military, on, on the defense industry. Um, the, I mean, I guess that the, the minerals that, that we need, they're, they're similar, but um, ultimate, ultimately, the thing is we don't have very clear regulations on them. I guess this is the main issue. Um, so we have very little to go on with it. Um, there are specific minerals that have been identified. Uh, I've seen the US report as well on the defense. They have a couple of specific missile defense system that they've identified. So I would suspect that that's going to be a national security question, and therefore they probably will need to outsource that one way or another. Um, I do know that the, both the executive order by Trump and uh, by Biden on national security, on supplies of, uh, you know, supply resilience, they have uh, mentioned very clearly defense, security and defense sector. So I think it's one of those areas that uh, people don't really talk about. Um, all my engagement with Wilson Center is on clean energy as well. So, so I mean, just to also make that point that even the American institutions that I work with seem to be, uh, they, they are not touching the defense question. Yes, it, it is definitely a, it's not a particularly transparent sector. So uh, getting information is difficult. Uh, and you're right, in terms here in the United States, there's been actually bipartisan support for a congressional yeah. legislation on strategic materials. And, and that clearly has defense um, implications. And bipartisan anything in this country is very unusual. So when the two <laughs> parties come together in support yeah. of legislation, you know that there is kind of an overriding uh, yeah. imperative. Um, we're coming to the last kind of 15 minutes. Uh, encourage people to ask uh, any last questions you might have. Um, 
I, I want to throw in two questions. One uh, is about Africa. We have a number of folks uh, here from Africa and they're, I'm sure, curious about uh, the role Africa will play, especially you know, given your discussion of kind of the hegemonic you know, geopolitical struggles uh, that, that are taking place. Um, and, uh, and you know, there are, there's uh, some uh, investment in Madagascar that's being considered for uh, rare earth mining um, and elsewhere on the continent, as well as of course, other critical materials, cobalt, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and the second uh, in which you can perhaps answer first, there were a couple of comments, people very concerned that the overriding necessity for rare earth elements might lead to a weakening generally speaking of environmental um, regulations. And, and I don't hear you saying that. I don't hear you recommending a weakening of environmental regulations, but this would be an opportunity for you to respond to those, those comments. Yeah, so my, I think I'll pick up on the weakening of environmental regulations. I can speak at least about the current um, debate at the moment in Europe about EU-Africa relations. So um, one of the main concern in Europe, of course, apart from accessing these minerals, is how how they have to how the EU is going to reposition itself vis-a-vis -vis China. And as you know, China is extremely well placed in the con in, in in Africa. So in in that context, there's been a lot of rhetoric around the EU exporting quote unquote European values, um, partnership, and um, as a partnership as opposed to dependency. And I guess they are hinting on two things. One is the debt trap diplomacy that, that, that you know, quote unquote debt trap diplomacy of the Chinese. And then second, the weak social environmental regulations. I mean, I suspect the issue is whether African governments will take up that offer. Because ultimately, um, it's up to the African governments to decide whether they will shift back to the Europeans and Americans, or you know, um, will they retain that relationship with China? I do know that there's a lot more contention over China's presence in many parts of the BRI country. So we, we're doing a big research on BRI as well. Um, we've done um, research in Greece, you know, the acquisition of the port. So I do know that there's a lot of issues that are emerging. Part of that are obligations of the Chinese, etc. So I guess the, the issue is whether that's sufficient justification to change, you know, the contract to, 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 to move away from China um, and to accept the higher socio-environmental costs of mining. From the, from the point of view of the EU, because they need the minerals, I would suspect they're willing to pay the high price because they, the choice is you either buy it at a higher price in the market or you mine within your own territory. So if they're not mining within Europe, then you have to get it from, it's one or the other. There's really no third option at the moment. Um, well, the third option is you keep dependence on China which is also not an, an option at the moment for, for the European Union, at least from the, if we look at it from a more discursive, you know, the rhetoric that they have on China, strategic autonomy, et cetera. So what I'm hoping for is that, you know, that if, if the European investment, because it, it's not gonna be public money that they're going to leverage, it's really trying to get private investment. They're gonna, the EU will try to nudge EU investors, EU investment to move into strategic mining projects. So I would suspect and I would hope that the weakening of environmental regulations would not be would not be part of that deal. But of course, that's really more of a question of how multinational companies behave, what kind of regulatory frameworks are in place. Um, on the part of the EU, definitely there's a lot of debate on standard setting. The, the, the mining industry is very clear that they would like to raise the level of mining regulations, at least within the EU, because, because the, it's a very unpopular industry here. So I think whether that is going to translate into something concrete outside of the EU is going to be something that we need to look at. I do know as well, I have a postdoc who's working on MENA, Middle East and North Africa, 
and he was saying that uh, you know the Germans are heavily involved in Tunisia, in in in, in Algeria, etc. So I I I suspect that um, I would hope at least that you know when these European companies are moving out of of Europe um, and knowing that they are under pressure to compete with China, that they would need they would imagine they would have um, environment better environmental regulation as an asset. To be more to increase their acceptability vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the Chinese companies that are in in the in Africa. Excellent, and and you know to, to throw in another uh, wrinkle into this, of course, is the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the European uh, yeah. EU has as is kind of considering as part of the European Green Deal, which is interesting because you know you say there's a choice: you either mine it here or you buy it at a higher price. But then if this spam goes into, into effect, it's effectively penalizing other countries for their dirty manufacturing. Yes, yes. And, <laughs> so yeah. it, it, will, it will either, if, if there's no money that's supplied for countries to clean up their manufacturing, or in this case, to clean up the mining process, then it, it makes it uh, even more challenging uh, on both sides of the, of the equation. Yeah. I, I think this is why they really are pushing for recycling as kind of as if it's a, as, a, as, as if it's a policy alternative. What's interesting, of course, is if you ask them directly, the EU Commission, you know, do you think this is going to solve it? They like, they no, it won't. Like everyone knows it won't. That's the main point, I think. But I guess not having investing in recycling is worse than than you know not close because I think that. Um, they're really hoping that industrial recycling can, can play a much bigger role in the, the secondary supply chain will play a bigger role over uh, the medium term, at least. Um, I think it is more of a long-term strategy as opposed to something to, to, to resolve existing problems that the EU has at the moment. Yeah, and, but, and as you say, the technology is, is rapidly changing yes. so yes. What, what is not viable today in terms of reuse and recycle might become yeah. viable in in a couple of years and in fact as you said you, you pointed out and for, this is very important that there is a five to ten year kind of um, process in the mining uh, industry so that you have both uh, you have a couple of challenges and I want to get to the last question here that someone asked um, you have the possibility of, of being saddled with a stranded asset. In other words, something you've spent yeah. five to 10 years developing and then you've developed it and there's no longer a market or you've been undercut yeah. by another technology. Um, and that, that makes it challenging, I think, especially for uh, in the rare earth sector as, as one of the uh, questioners asked, you're, you're basically talking about, you know, if you're talking about copper and iron, there's, you're pretty confident that if you're going to make that investment in a copper mine or an iron mine, uh, iron ore mine, you're going to get, you know, returns. Yeah. Rare earth elements, mm, maybe not. Um, you yes. don't necessarily have that, that confidence. And so, you know, uh, how is that, how does that play out in the, in the kind of calculus of the mining industry and, and of governments too, that are kind of trying to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis rare earth elements? Well, I mean, the other point to make is that mining companies themselves can't win against Chinese rare earth companies. So the interviews we've been conducting in mining companies in Brazil, for example, they were pretty clear that um, it was a choice not to develop the rare earth industry, the rare earth processing, because they cannot outcompete China in terms of pricing. Also, the Chinese can just change the, you know, they can just manipulate the price and then you could be out of the market. Then the other point is that they have control over processing technology. And so why would a company without government support invest in this particular sector if you know that you, you know, the risk is too high? And so I think this is also the, from, from that point of view of, of investment, um, the rare earth industry is a high risk sector uh, for, for many of these companies that may have the ability or the capacity or potential to, to develop uh, and eventually compete against China but, or Chinese companies, um, but, but they won't do it be, un, unless you have government support. So this is also the, 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 the final point that I want to make with respect to, 
you know, uh, uh, China, the public policy is really central. There is now, you know, at least in the context of the EU, there's an understanding that companies are not going to undertake these risky investments unless the state or the EU would do it, would, would, would make some, you know, would share the risk. But of course, there's, a, there's another part of that question, which is that why should the public, you know, why should the taxpayers be subsidizing the profit of mining companies? Uh, but then because it becomes, as I said, it's not just an economic question anymore, you know, the EU is concerned about geopolitical and security issues. So yes, there's an incentive to, to, to put in public money into these sectors as what they've done in battery, but I think they've managed to do that because clean energy technology is politically savvy, you know, as a campaign within Europe, and so there's less question about that. I'm not sure whether that's going to fly with, you know, rare earth mining, for example, where um, a we don't know how much rare earth there is in Europe, except in Sweden, and then b countries are pretty happy to keep certain their position within the supply chain. So, for example, Estonia and France they have the refining they have refining companies of rare earth elements. So they're in pretty strategic positions anyway to begin with. And so once you have that technology and you can keep that, why would you want to make more risky investments? So then, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a difficult situation. You know, where do you put in public money that could be justified, you know, by the EU and by their national governments? Yeah, that, that is a essential question. And in fact, it was one of our last questions, which was about the the mix between public and private money, nationalization of the industry versus privatization. Um, something that the new Chilean government is, is uh, debating around lithium, for example. Yes. Um, so this is, this is an ongoing question. Um, but we, we are uh, coming to the end here. And I really want to thank you. Uh, Jojo Nem Singh has provided a really a, a magisterial kind of uh, look at the global supply chain, some of the challenges that are faced at a national level and even challenges at the local level as, as well. There are no easy answers, uh, unfortunately, um, with many of these, these questions. Um, I want to encourage folks, if they haven't already, to send me their contact information if they'd like to join us uh, in the Rare Earth Element Group or Regroup. Um, and uh, we will, of course, provide a um, a recording of, of this for folks if they missed part of it and all the unlucky folks who were not here today <laughs> can watch it in their spare time. Um, and we will continue to do uh, both uh, events that are uh, kind of geared towards more scholarly understanding of, of rare earth elements as well as more activist oriented strategy sharing, best practices sharing events as well. So I hope we will get a chance to see you at some of our future events. Um, again, my name is John Pfeffer. I'm with the Institute for Policy Studies, and we have a global just transition project within which this rare earth element group, along with our partners in Barcelona and in uh, Madagascar, have been essential. And Jojo Nem Singh, I look forward to working with you in the future on these issues. And then yeah, if uh, anyone is interested to reach out to us for collaborations, we, we have like so many events that are taking place, conferences uh, in the next two years. We're organizing things in Latin America, in Kazakhstan for the BRI and Rare Earth. Um, so we would be very interested to, to be in touch with people uh, if, if, you, if you want to, to work with us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so for, much, John. Thank you. And thank you for the excellent questions and uh, the perceptive answers and your comments as well, which are duly noted in the chat. And we'll try to incorporate in the report on this event as well. Um, so uh, I will wrap this up now and uh, look forward to, to speaking with you all on future occasions. Thank you again. Thank you.